from you. There we go. Okay. Um, and uh, so now I've got the pleasure of introducing Mark Hagland, who's being um, our speaker this evening, talking about the lifelong journey of the transracial adoptee. Um, just a few things about Mark as we get going. Um, Mark was born in South Korea and raised by American parents. He's been active in forums and around um, in forums around transracial adoption, both in person and online for over two decades. Um, Mark is all over the place online, so um, very active. Um, he's contributed to team writing anthologies about adult transracial adoptees, including Parenting as Adoptees, Outsiders Within, and the Unknown Culture Club. Earlier this year, he self-published a book called The Extraordinary Journey, The Lifelong Path of the Transracial Adoptee. In his professional life, Mark is a healthcare journalist, and he's joining us from Chicago. And with that, I give you Mark. Thank you so much, Betsy, and great to... I was gonna say great to see you all. You, I can't actually see you, but great to know you're here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, Betsy has asked me to share a little bit about myself, which I'll do. Uh, she's already given me a couple of questions from the audience, so I'll address those. And then we'll do a nice lengthy Q&A. And I would love to hear anything that anyone has to say uh, or ask. So, um, Again, thank you. I, I hope that this will be helpful to people and meaningful. So um, I guess I'll just start with a very brief bio. Uh, I was born in South Korea in 1960. I was adopted at the age of eight months along with my twin brother and we were raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin by parents of Norwegian and German descent, thus my Norwegian name. Um, I grew up there and went to the University of Wisconsin, Madison undergrad. I came to uh, Chicago to get my master's in journalism at Northwestern University. And I came here in 1981 and I've been here ever since. I absolutely love Chicago. I'm a big booster as only people who uh, are not native can be boosters. Um, I began to get involved in um, the transracial adoption world in 2000. I attended a what we were calling mini gathering, uh, a series of mini gatherings among Korean adoptees. There's actually a whole backstory to it. Um, let me see if I can give the one second version. The Holt Agency decided in 1999 that they were going to do a hyper poster child event. So they invited 400 adult Korean adoptees to Washington, D.C to get together, stand uh, on the steps of the US Capitol and look nice. And what they discovered was once the adoptees started talking, things took a completely different turn because adoptees wanted to talk about identity and uh, psychological struggles and even abuse. And the whole people did not want that to happen. So the adoptees decided to begin a series of what became a large number, about 15 mini gatherings in the United States, and then a series of what, what became ultimately every two or three years gatherings in Seoul, South Korea. So I attended the first mini gathering, which was held in Minneapolis in September 2000. Uh, I was nearly 40 years old and uh, my mind was blown because for the very first time in my life, I walked into a room and there was a peer group of people who were like me. And we were sitting at the dinner table and we were finishing each other's stories, you know, and we had just met a few minutes earlier uh, and it was mind blowing for all of us. So we Korean adoptees were among the first to really start to get together. And one of the reasons is that we were among the older adoptees. You know, I was in the first wave that had begun in the late 1950s after the end of the Korean War. Then uh, our sisters and brothers who were from India and Vietnam and later Ethiopia and later China and other countries uh, started to gather. And of course, at the same time also, domestic transracial adoptees from all races began to gather and find each other. We also began to create a literature of transracial adoption created by us, the transracial adoptees. Um, I began to participate in conferences. So this was 
if anyone remembers back to the olden days of 2000, that was before most people were on Facebook. And uh, I'm not sure Facebook existed in 2000. It took a few years after that. And so people were in Yahoo groups, uh, if you remember those, and people were attending conferences. And I started getting involved in a conference called the Khan Conference, Korean American Adoptee and Adoptive Family Network. And I really learned a huge amount there. It was the first time I had really encountered a large number of white transracially adoptive parents. And we were dialoguing and we learned a lot. And in the process, I realized, wow, there were just how much education needed to happen for adoptive parents. Uh, so many adoptive parents have good motivations. Uh, they love their children, but they themselves are white people raised in whiteness. And I realized that those of us, especially the older generations of transracial adoptees could help a lot. We could share our experiences. Um, and so that became a huge mission for me, a passionate mission, um, two-sided, one to support my fellow adult transracial adoptees on their journeys, while I myself continue on my lifelong journey. And second, to really, um, educate parents who want to learn. Um, <clears throat> I found that a lot of the same questions and issues came up over and over and over. There was no, uh, there were no real surprises. Uh, and I can say after being involved for two decades, I, I think I've just about heard it all. <laughs> I'm sure there will be a few times when someone will surprise me, but what, I came to realize was that there are commonalities. There are commonalities among adult transracial adoptees and there are commonalities among parents. Um, among the parents, really the most, the biggest commonalities are around both race and adoption. Um, most adoptive parents need help understanding the challenges that adopted children face in their lives. Um, there are a lot of psychological, social, and cultural issues. For me, as a transracial adoptee, the issues around race have been really prominent. Um, and one of the things that I try to explain to people, because there are some real misunderstandings out in adoption land, um, one of the strange misperceptions that I hear all the time, it kind of boils down to something like, well, if you had abusive parents, which sadly a number of adoptees did, then you're going to be a quote unquote angry, bitter adoptee. But if you had good parents, then you'll be a happy, happy adoptee. And in fact, that's completely untrue. I know adoptees who had wonderful parents who struggle mightily with a number of issues. I also know adoptees who sadly grew up with abuse or neglect or simply parents who really weren't equipped to be parents, let alone adoptive parents who are doing fine, basically. Um, and one of the things that happens all the time in forums, both in person and online, is the strange um, framing of the happy versus the angry adoptee. And that's where I get to mention over and over that I am neither. <laughs> I'm a complex person. Um, and that even though I had loving parents, I struggled a great deal with many issues. Um, one of the things I like to do, I like to say to parents, imagine per that terrible binary framing of happy and angry adoptees, I like to say, if you're a parent, imagine if you have to describe yourself as either a happy adoptive parent or an angry adoptive parent. And if you're a happy adoptive parent, you're dancing through fields of daisies on a summer afternoon 
perpetually uh, 24 7, 365. And if you're an angry adoptive parent, you're angry, bitter, despondent, and homicidal 24 7, 365. Well, obviously that's ridiculous, right? And the same is true for adoptees. We all have complexity. I don't know any adoptees who are all one stereotype or the other. So one of the things that's been helpful for me is to facilitate the sharing of stories. And I ended up creating uh, a group. I mean, it's a little bit complicated because one group had to shut down and restart, but our group on Facebook is Transracial Adoption Perspectives. And uh, we have several thousand members. We ask all people to go first through our starter group called TAP 101, where we kind of share about the, the norms of the group so people understand what we're trying to do. Uh, we have a separate group also for adult transracial adoptees only. And uh, we just facilitate uh, discussions. I co-created the predecessor group that became TAP, that became Transracial Adoptee uh, Adoption Perspectives with Michelle Hughes, who is an adoption attorney and an adoptive parent and herself biracial. And we're local to each other. I, she had asked me to sit on some panels that she uh, had facilitated uh, training around race and adoption. And we basically decided just to create a Facebook group. And the thing that we absolutely share in common is we felt that there was a need to sit in complexity, to create a group that facilitated the complex discussions. At the time that we created the original group about eight years ago, almost nine now, I'd have to go back and think, but it, it's several years ago. Um, we basically saw that on Facebook, there were only two kinds of groups. There were what we call the rainbows and unicorns groups, which are almost entirely white transracially adopted parent dominated. And they are totally rainbows and unicorns. There's, there's nary a cloud in the sky and they basically disallow any complex or challenging discussion around transracial adoption. And then at the other end, we, we saw that there were some hyper anti-adoption groups. And I, Michelle and I both agreed that we, we needed a space that was educational. Uh, we're not, our group is not a support group. And now we have several satellite groups. Um, they're not support groups, but they support through education. And wonderful things have happened. For example, one of our members created a Spanish language group. I got involved in that and that sp sprouted a few other groups. So as a result, one of my blessings or gifts was I ended up becoming fluent Spanish. Um, and then uh, about a year and a half ago, one of our members in Denmark created a Scandinavian uh, group. And so I'm studying Danish now. <laughs> which is my seventh language. And uh, so I enjoy it. And I love, and it's fascinating because you would think, oh, okay, a group with who, most of whose members are in Spain and or Latin America would be so different. Or a group whose members are in Norway, Sweden, Denmark would be so different. And yet they're really not. It's, it's quite, quite astonishing actually. Um, and I have found a tremendous commonality among adult transracial adoptees. We're all individual, of course. We all have individual histories. We have individual perspectives. We're, we are individuals, but the commonalities are astonishing. You know, I can communicate with, uh, for example, one person I know, a Bangladeshi Danish adoptee or a Chinese Spanish adoptee or an Argentine Spanish adoptee. It's, I could go on and on. <laughs> Those are actual people. And, or a Colombian Norwegian adoptee. And you would be amazed how much we have in common. So I ended up contributing to several books, as Betsy mentioned, uh, Parenting as Adoptees is an amazing book. Uh, my contribution is very small. The others are just completely astonishing. Um, I contributed to one of the first anthologies uh, created by a team of adult transracial adoptees 
uh, Outsiders Within. And then there was one with Korean adoptees called the Unknown Culture Club. So at the end of last year, I just decided, well, it's time to write my own book. I'm not getting any younger here. <laughs> I'm gonna be 61. And so <clears throat> I wrote my own ebook. Uh, you can find it at markhaglandbook.com. And it's called Extraordinary Journey, The Lifelong Path of the Transracial Adoptee. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't print it. Everyone wants a printed book, but that would have been really expensive. So I created it as an ebook. And what I wanted to do with that book was to really <clears throat> frame it a certain way. There are many, many, many wonderful personal narratives now out there by transracial adoptees, tons of them. And I love them all, they're fabulous. And there are some in uh, anthologies, as I mentioned, but I wanted to create something a little bit different. It really is a series of reflections or med meditations on the lifelong path of the transracial adoptee, which I think is a lifelong path. And I also, by the way, think that the path of the transracially adopted parent is a lifelong one. And so I talk about my experiences, but it is definitely not a personal memoir or a personal narrative in that sense. I bring in some of my lived experiences um, in order to illustrate points. And then I interviewed 13 <clears throat> fellow We lost your sound. You're on mute. There you go. I did. I did not actually mute myself. Someone muted me. Oh, sorry. They, they want. Know. They wanted to silence me. No, that's okay. I'm just joking. Anyway, uh, so I interviewed 13 um, transracial adoptees and uh, fellow adoptees, and their experiences are so diverse. It's it's kind of amazing. You'll find it amazing. They, it, different ages, genders, races, backgrounds, migrations, uh, lived experiences. So one adoptee who was raised in an open adoption, um, several who are in birth family reunion, uh, every kind of experience. And so I basically just wanted to um, give people a sense of the absolute breadth of experiences that we represent. So before we open it to Q&A from this audience, I am going to open up the two questions that Betsy had sent me. So I'll read the two questions, then I'll respond to them. And then Betsy, I'll have you open a general q and if, if that's okay with you. Um, so the first question was, what advice do you have for other TRAs who struggle with their identity and how do you attempt to factor in your original identity when it isn't reflected in the world you were raised in? Yes, so I wrote a whole book about that, <laughs> but my basic thoughts are this. Um, one of the fundamental challenges for us transracial adoptees is we actually have to create our identity. We have to architect. How do, you, how do you find your identity as a person of color when you were raised in total or near total whiteness and you don't have any reference points and you're not able to be yourself reflective? Um, so one of the core things really is you've got to find fellow POC. You've got to find other people of color, both of your own race and or ethnicity and of all races that are non-white. Um, I started to meet fellow POC when I was a young adult here in Chicago uh, in my twenties. And it was hard at first because I was just too white, but I figured out <laughs> how to not be white. And it took a while. Um, and now my, my whole sense of myself is absolutely different from what it was 40 years ago. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. And I feel comfortable with POC of all races. Um, you've just got to go out and find them. If you, if you were raised in whiteness um, and you don't have any reference points, just go out and break out of that. 
um, and find fellow trans, you, you need to find two species. You need to find fellow transversal adoptees and you need to find POC horn hot adoptees. Both are equally important. And then the other question, how do you handle being in a family that doesn't consider you as family because you're not blood related and you're a different ethnicity from the whole family in a different country? Ah, that's another big question. Um, I will share the fact that after my parents died, they both died when my twin brother and I were very young. My father died when, just before my 13th birthday and my mother died when I was 23. And then after that, a lot changed. And, and then, well, my grandparents died, all my aunts and uncles died, a few cousins died, a lot of people died. So I really don't have any active relationship with my cousins at all, which is fine. There are a lot of reasons for that. One of them simply is I, I'm a complete Martian to them. And the life that I live and the identity that I hold is so different. They're all from a very, very, very specific background, um, which to me is very narrow and limited and limiting. Um, and I will say that after my parents died, it became clear to me and my brother that I don't want to say that we weren't welcome because that would be a little bit reductive. It became very clear once we became adults that we really had nothing in common with them. And so I let go of it as well. I didn't really have any strong desire. I had had a kind of relationship with a few of my cousins, but it didn't really survive that transition. So that's a hard question. I don't have any easy answer for it. Uh, what the ultimate endpoint for me was that I don't have a relationship with them. Uh, every adoptee will have to figure that out for themselves. And it can be challenging because if you were an adoptee, if you were a transracial adoptee, if you were an adoptee of color and you were raised in total whiteness, um, in order to find yourself, you're going to have to leave your background, either physically and geographically, or at least mentally, socially, and culturally. So it's going to be hard. And I don't, I can't offer any easy answer. All I can say is you have to be true to yourself. And if you feel that the people you're interacting with in your original background, or I mean, your background of adoption, don't fit where you need to go, then you just need to let go and do what you need to do. So I, I wish there were some easy answer. I wish there were a rainbows and unicorns answer <laughs> to that. There's, there's like no rainbows and unicorns answer. But what I will say is I feel incredibly um, happy uh, in having found the identity that I found and built the life I've built. It's absolutely different from what I grew up with. And again, I'll just emphasize, I had very loving parents. They were wonderful parents, but the background I grew up in was so stultifying, so narrow, so limiting, um, so restrictive. I, the, when I was a child, I like to joke that I had two aspirations and one I utterly failed at and the other I utterly succeeded at. So the first one was to be like everyone else. I failed like a billion percent <laughs> at that. The other one to escape, I succeeded brilliantly at. <laughs> so that's, that's my story. How does that sound, Betsy? Fantastic, thank you for sharing so much. Um, so I have one or two questions that were posted to me. Um, and uh, one, uh, actually, they're both direct messages. So one adoptee um, is wondering um, if you can reflect on the commonalities and differences around transracial adoption or um, non-transracial adoption. Um, mm. She's feeling like a lot of what you said maybe relates to um, adoptive families, whether they're transracial or not. Yeah. Um, one great blessing in my life among many others is I got to, through a friend of a friend, I became friend, good friends uh, with a, a white same race adoptee. And we've known each other for about 25 years. And he really helped me sort through 
what's adoption and what's transracial adoption. Um, there's a lot that's just adoption in general. Uh, the feeling of differentness in general is adoption. Um, the need to figure out who you are is I think common among all adoptees. What's different is as my white same race adoptee friend said, well, yeah, I mean, growing up, you know, I could go out in public and no one questioned who I was or who my family was or how we were related to each other. He and his sister were both adopted. They're not biological to each other, adopted by their parents. And I said, yeah, that was so different. My twin and I, um, I mean, we were in the first wave of international adoption. And in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1963, we just did not look like a family to people. So people would point at us, I guess they were never taught not to point, and they would say to my parents, whose children are those? And my mother would say, well, they're ours, of course. But, you know, at that time and in that place, we did not look like a family. So one of the things that transracial adoptees grow up with is what's called the narrative burden. And I always want to uh, credit Sumitra Dorner, who's an Indian adoptee, who I interviewed for my book, by the way, um, who came up with the term, the narrative burden, which is the need that people who are visibly different or provoke some response that people have to explain themselves because people demand it. Uh, or as I like to call it, the what are you question, which is like half of the story of my life. And that's what transracial adoptees have. Uh, they get that from white people, they get that from people of color, they get it from people in their birth culture and birth race, they get it from everyone. Um, I have spent my whole life explaining who I am, you know, why I have a Norwegian name, <laughs> and um, I'm fine with it, you know, it, but, but yeah, that's like my entire life. There's this amazing video called What Kind of Asian Are You? If you go to YouTube, just type in What Kind of Asian Are You? And it's the greatest video ever. And I, I like to say basically it's half of my life. And it's a young Asian, yeah, youngish Asian woman is jogging and she stops to stretch. And this white guy stops to stretch. And of course, immediately she gets the narrative burden of what are you? And she has to explain herself, but it's hilarious. It's written by an Asian director. And uh, it's, only, it's only about, four or five minutes long, but you have to watch it. Anyway, that's, that's like half of my life is the, what are you? So that's one of the big differences. Um, so I have a follow-up question to that. Um, you mentioned your name a couple of times and um, I've known some adoptees that have changed their names or taken on yeah. the birth name or part of their birth name as, as their name combining things. Um, have you ever thought about that? Because that's, you know, so people look at you and they see Korean, and then you have this you know, um, name that doesn't reflect that. Um, I mean, it's complicated because, so there's one piece of my name story that I'd like, like to keep private. Uh, which complicates it. But what I can say publicly is that um, I believe, I mean, I would have the narrative burden anyway. One of my good Korean adoptee friends changed her name to full Korean. And now she gets what I call the reverse narrative burden. So she meets Koreans or Korean Americans and she says her name and, and they immediately launch into rapid fire Korean. Oh, and she's like, oh, okay, I don't speak any Korean. And then of course she gets the horrible Korean shaming questions. Why you don't speak Korean? And so you're going to get it anyway. I, I have always had this name. Um, even if I were to change a part of my name to my Korean name, um, I would still have the narrative burden. And in a weird sense, my name does reflect me because it reflects my life. It reflects the fact that I grew up with a Norwegian American father and a German American mother. And I love my dad. And I don't, you know, I don't really, I'm just gonna have the narrative burden anyway. So I'm comfortable with it. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have another question about um, what is your best advice for adoptive parents of a transracially adopted teen who's working on discovering their identity and how can the parents help? You know, keep loving your teen. 
they're they're going to go through te- you know teenagers i had a teenager my daughter's about to turn 20 so she's just getting out of her teens now <laughs> teenagers are tough anyway and teenage life is tough one of the things that i think parents adoptive parents need to understand is that for us transracial adoptees our sense of identity is constantly fluid especially when we're younger one of the people who's become a very close and dear friend to me is Susan Harris O'Connor. She has a book called The Harris Narratives. You can get it on Amazon. It is brilliant. It's very short. You can read it in an hour and a half if you read fast. And Sue basically explains how we have different frames of reference for our identity, internal, biological, And one of the things, if you have a teenager, is they're trying to figure out how to fit into the world, how to figure out, uh, trying to figure out how to fit into peer groups. And it's tough. You know, everyone wants to fit in. As I said, you know, my my great aspiration to be like everyone else and fit in, I was an abject failure, but I was a great success at escaping. So um, I think that the key thing is give, you know, show your teen that you absolutely support them no matter what. You know, I mean, I'm say we're in your house now, but I mean, show them that you support them as they struggle with identity, as they try on things. We have a transracial adoptee who is in her early 20s who just posted in our TAP group, Transracial Adoption Perspectives on Facebook. She has decided to she hasn't decided yet whether she might legally change her name, but she wants to take her birth name uh, socially and use it. And she hasn't told her parents, basically the way she explained it is that they're racist and, and they've trashed her birth culture to her. So above all, don't trash your child's birth culture. Obviously don't be racist. And make sure that your teenager understands if they want one day to be called boobity boo okay they're boobity boo today you know and then the next day you know and if they if they want to say you know i'm my whole life is defined by my race trust me two days afterwards it won't be so let them be who they are and make sure that they know that you support them and make sure they know you support them by making it clear that you're not just living in a purely white world. <laughs> you know, I know many adoptee, transracial adoptees who um, they don't know that their parents support them. You know, they don't know that their parents have their backs if they want to explore identity. Um, I think my parents might have been hurt if I had changed my name, but I want to believe that they would have understood my emotional drive in thinking about that. I, I have to believe that they would have understood that. Um, so Mark, I see a lot of parents who um, express that they are waiting for their child to ask questions or to bring up adoption. Yeah versus the parent being proactive and bringing it up. Um, Can you talk about your thoughts about that a little bit? I have pretty strong feelings. (laughs) Don't wait about anything. Don't wait to talk about adoption, normalize adoption. Don't wait to talk about race. Don't wait to talk about racism. So I have to share my traffic safety story. Let's see, because one of the questions that comes up all the time in our groups and, and I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of a, a composite version of this, but this comes up like every few months, inevitably. And the composite version is, uh, my little Susie is three years old and I want her to stay innocent for a while. So I'm not gonna talk about race or racism. I'll just wait until she brings it up. And my head explodes every time and then I quietly put it back on. And I came up with uh, a frame that adopted parents can understand. And this applies to adoption as well, but this is specifically about race. So I say, 
<clears throat> imagine if you said, if you were sitting down to coffee with a friend and you said, my little Susie is three years old and I don't want to traumatize her by letting her know that crossing the street could be dangerous and she could be hurt. So I'm just gonna let her run into traffic and be hit by a car. And then after she is in the ICU with all her bones broken and her internal organs punctured, I'm gonna pull a chair up to her bedside and we're gonna have a nice conversation about traffic safety. And the parents all go, oh, and I say, yes, that's race and that's racism. I experienced racism as a kind of a primal trauma when I went to kindergarten. And we didn't have a preschool, I'm not saying. And um, I think back to that now. And one thing that absolutely fuels my sense of mission in participating in all of these groups, you know, in writing my book and participating in book writing with other adoptees is that the fact that white transracially adopted parents who were raised in whiteness start out a lot of times pretty clueless. And that's not a judgment. It's just a perception of the reality. Um, they need to understand that they have to normalize adoption, race, and the discussion of racism from the time before their child can even understand. One good thing that my parents did, they had zero resources. Imagine we went to kindergarten in 1964. There, were, there was nothing, like literally nothing. Um, and they had great emotional intelligence and figured some things out with zero resources. But can you imagine how much better it would have been for me had I been prepared for the lifelong experience of racism, which is what POC experienced? I mean, it's just astonishing to me the extent to which most white people in our society have no clue whatsoever. And when people ask me, I say, well, no, I don't experience racism every single day, but I do experience it regularly. And black people in this country experience it like a billion times more often than I do. So all three subjects, adoption, race, racism, you have to, you just talk about, talk about them at home, show videos, read books. It's amazing the books they have for young children now. You know, in my, in my day, I mean, this really ages me, right? We had Dick and Jane and they were super, super, super white, right? <laughs> and you only saw white people. Uh, I'm surprised the dog wasn't white and now it's wonderful. I have an independent bookstore in my neighborhood, only about six, five, six blocks from me. It's fabulous what they have, you know, normalizing Latino children with disabilities, for example, normal, you know, everything. It's just fabulous. And so get out there, create a non-white world for your child, please. And yeah, just talk about adoption. Talk about it. You know, one of the things that my parents did do was that they explained to me and my brother before we went to kindergarten exactly what we were. We were Korean, we were Asian, although back in the early 60s, they used that horrible term Oriental. Please don't ever say Oriental. Uh, and we knew, and we were adopted, of course. So people weren't, you know, when other people inevitably, because I think. I'm sure that my parents were asked when we we're babies in the stroller, whose children are those, like they realized early on. Um, oh, and learn correct racial terminology, please. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. We have white parents joining these groups who have black and brown children who don't even know how to use the correct terms and they're using food terms. And by the way, I have a, uh, a sidebar in my book uh, entitled, Never, please never, ever, ever say the word Caucasian. So please never say Caucasian. And my book explains it's both racist and it's euphemistic. Don't say Caucasian, say white and black. Say correct, basic racial, racial terms. Teach those to your children. We have parents in our groups who, well, the worst is the parents who will never join our groups who most need them. Uh, but we have parents joining our groups who have children who are four years old and already going to preschool 
and they're using food colors for themselves. It's just like, no, just it's like a hard no. You know, when you're too, okay, you, you, you'll say a few food colors and you'll quickly explain your skin is medium brown, but we call that black. And you, you can explain race to a child. My daughter, who's biological to me, I started explaining race very young to her uh, because she's multiracial. Um, but if your child is adopted, they're experiencing race when they're a baby. You know, experiments, um, research, they've even shown babies as young as six months old see race <laughs> the, because society does. My daughter saw race when she was about 14 months old, I could tell. So anyway, and please don't say Caucasian. Read my book, find out why. <laughs> Um, I think I might know your answer to this. Um, one of our um, participants um, is asking, um, do you feel that you were cheated out of knowing or understanding your Korean culture, or are you okay with the culture of your parents? And I, I hear a lot of what you're saying through that both and lens. So um, what, what yeah. are your thoughts about that? I mean, first of all, Betsy, I want to um, honor, respect, and recognize that every international adoptee has a different experience and a different perspective. Many adoptees do feel cheated. Many feel that they were deracinated. The, the French were deraciné, uprooted. I don't feel that way for a number of reasons. First of all, I don't feel that way for a really basic reason that when I was born in South Korea in 1960, the country was still devastated by the war. And there were hundreds of thousands of children wandering the street in rags. I don't believe I would have had a better life. I would have been in an orphanage. Um, my twin and I nearly died. They weren't feeding us. And my parents, who are of very humble means, were sending money over. And uh, we weren't being fed. So when we came over at eight months old, my mother had bought uh, you know those footy pajamas. She bought eight month footy pajamas. We were only 10 pounds each. The footy pajamas went like two feet beyond our feet. So the other thing for me that's very clear, I'm also a gay man and there's still a lot of homophobia in South Korea and society, Korean society. It's extremely conformist. So no, I don't feel cheated of that, um, but I, I absolutely honor and respect those adoptees who feel that way. I am such an anarchic person that I never would have fit into the ultra conformist East Asian culture. But many adoptives, adoptees do feel that way. And I want to make sure that people understand that I honor and respect their perspectives. We're all individuals, it's amazing how broad the spectrum is. And, and also I've been to South Korea three times as an adult. So no, I don't, I don't feel cheated at all but some do. Okay, um, we have a question um, from a, a male adoptee um, saying that there are generally less men present in the adoptee communities that he's been part of and even fewer men of color like himself. Um, and uh, asking, um, he says he knows they're out there. So how, how um, do you think they can be reached effectively? They got to get out of their man cave. <laughs> <laughs> Men are just not joiners. Like in our, it's both adoptees and adoptive parents. I'll tell you, you know, in TAP, Transitional Adoption Perspectives, 95% of the adoptive parents who are commenting and participating actively are moms. And I'm always, I, I moderate the dad's group, which is basically kind of semi-dead. I shouldn't even say that because, but, but it's like women are the joiners, especially in, on social media. And I'm always asking where are the dads? And then I get this answer, which always makes me, my head explode and I have to put it back on. Well, I sure, you know, post some threads from this group with my husband and he reads them. <laughs> I'm like, come on, <laughs> really, we're, we're in 2021. So I would say, yeah, it's, it's challenging because Men are just not joiners in a society. And I will also add this on a serious note, you know, 
one of the things that happens is many adoptees struggle with loneliness, isolation, depression. And in our society, most men handle that by not handling it, right? They're doing video games or quietly drinking in the basement, you know? So it's a challenge. Um, you have to go out and find them. You have to kind of browbeat them to do things. There's a small number of men who are, who are, who are active and participate, but yeah, it's, it's overwhelmingly women, both among adoptees and adoptive parents. So I don't have a lot to benchmark it on, so I'm not sure if our group is any different or not, but we do have, and people have been surprised about this over the years, um, we do have a number of men that participate in our, what we just call general meetings, which are adoptee birth parent, um, adoptive parent support um, discussion groups. And um, so that's, um, you know, I can't guarantee any given meeting exactly who's gonna be there, but we do have an, a number of men, a number of men of color that, um, that come. Good. I'm glad. For I'm men, glad, yeah. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. I know it's, I you know I as a man I kind of feel a little bit awkward about this, uh, but you know I know how men are, but the thing that always makes my head explode is when women say, "Well, I show my husband the the threads," and I'm like, "Okay, can you get him to join, please, and participate?" <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. parenting, parenting is not just all women in 2021 come on oh. so I, I put the link to those meetings in the chat um, Great. so uh let's see we have time for one or two more questions um people are asking for more resources um other resources for korean adoptees specifically uh if you're, well, first of all, Khan is a wonderful resource. The Korean American Adoptee Adoptive Family Network, Khan, K-A-N, they changed the name of the website, so I forget it now. But if you just Google Khan, Korean American Adoptee Adoptive Family Network, you'll find it. They have a website and they also have a Facebook page. They're excellent. That's one of the best resources. I have a bunch of resources uh, at the end of my book, but obviously I can't read all the URLs. <laughs> so you'll kind of have to go there and find it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and somebody's asking uh, if you want to share, this might be private, but um, do you have a good relationship with your twin and does he participate in transracial adoption perspectives? He or she is. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit complicated. I, I think, um, I think it would be best to leave that private. And I apologize, but I don't want to speak for my twin. Absolutely, that's fine. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Mark, over the years that you've been involved, it sounds like about 20 years, um, what, what types of things do you think have stayed the same or what types of things do you think have changed? I should ask that in the reverse order. What has changed yeah. and what has stayed the same? Well, three things have changed. First of all, people have gotten together and social media have been amazing in that. I mean, they've brought us together from all over the world. Secondly, I do think we've made some progress in our society in understanding a little bit about race, a little bit about transracial adoption. Uh, we still have a tremendously long way to go, but society has changed in the last 20 years for the better overall. Uh, I mean, we're in this horrible period of kind of like racist reaction, but most people in our society have moved forward. And the other thing that's changed a lot is, you know, we transracial adoptees, as I say, we've created this wonderful literature, books, films, documentaries, videos, blogs, articles. You can literally type in, if you, if you Google transracial adoption, adult transracial adoptee, you will, you know, you'll, uh, you'll strike gold. So the, the resources are out there. And we adoptees have gotten together. And I think it's really accelerated our, our journeys. It has for me, you know, it's been tremendously healing for me. Um, I'm basically an optimist. So I don't, I mean, the, th the one thing that distresses me the very most, I always say the people who should be joining our groups who most need them are the least likely to join them. 
And we still have white parents raising black and brown children in total or near total whiteness in 2021. And that's just sad. Um, we, we need for parents to give their children daily mirrors of their own race and ethnicity and all non-white races. That's absolutely essential. One of the things that I grew up with was a horrible, horrible physical self-image. I am still working on that now. I'm 60 years old. I'm going to be 61 next month. Um, and that's from growing up in near total whiteness. And even, and yes, I always say it because I want people to understand I had loving parents. My mother told me I was handsome, but I didn't believe it because the entire society told me every day that I was completely uh, unacceptable. And as I like to say, I said, I wrote this in my book, basically, I look back now and it was clear to me that being non-white was virtually a capital crime growing up. And I never really got over that. And um, man, I hope that if there's a white adoptive parent out there who is viewing this, who's living in near total or total whiteness with their young child who's black or brown, I would beg you, please move into diversity, create diversity where you are, give your child daily racial mirrors of their own race and all non-white races, um, colorize your world because why should your child who's three years old now in 2021 have to spend 40 years struggling to accept how they appear? That really is a punishment. And if you love your child, you'll do better. Bye. Thank you. Very well said. Um, that's a segue actually to, uh, we just have time maybe for one more question. Um, okay. But I have a question that kind of fits into that. You mentioned um, feeling like you were too white, you know, growing up very white. Um, and I've seen um, different approaches by parents um, over the years. And I've seen parents who incorporate people of color into their circles and into their social life. Um, and I've also seen parents that kind of drop their kids off somewhere, you know, to, to get that on their own. Like, okay, we're exposing them. They take them to visit the black people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about um, natural well, relationships? Um, I mean, Right. I mean, one of the things we had, we actually had someone, this is about seven years ago, we had a white mom in our tap group saying, um, I go into the grocery store and I see black women in the grocery store and I rush up to them and ask them if they'll be my friend. <laughs> we're like, okay, maybe they're freaking out for a reason because they think you're actually an ax murderer. Hi, I'd like to be your friend. What I tell parents is, you have to start as early as you can, like yesterday, finding natural organic ways to create organic friendships. So if you're into chess and your daughter is black, meet black people who love chess, right? Like if, if you're into knitting and your son is Latino, meet Latinx people who are into knitting or you know whatever, find a way to create and develop and evolve forward authentic relationships and friendships so that it's not just you, yeah, like dropping your black child off at the black picnic. Because I mean, although that's better than nothing, believe me, it, it, your child will get the message that what they are really isn't that acceptable, or at least it's marginal. Chris Winston, who created the Khan organization and their wonderful conferences, realized when her two Korean children were very, very young, that her dry cleaner wasn't really a friend. You know, she, she, she went into the dry cleaners and she tried to strike up a friendship. Well, you know, that, that wasn't what, and she realized that her children needed more than her having a friendly conversation with the dry cleaner when she picked up her dry cleaning, right? So you have to start at the beginning you, and, and that's why you have to move into some diversity. Because if you have to drive 20 miles to drop your child off at an event with people who look like your child, kind of like get a clue, right? Like that is not the best way to do this. So create organic experiences for yourself and your family so that you naturally meet people 
of your child's race and other races of color, rather than it being this weird artificial thing where once a month you drop them off at the black picnic or, you know what I mean? It just, your child needs more than that. Good, well, thank you very much. I'm sure that you will be getting some um, request to join the Transracial Adoption Perspectives group. Um, I, I yeah. um, have learned a lot by being a member of that group. I don't participate um, very much, but I, um, I like to read. Um, and I like what you said about um, getting support through education. I think that's yeah. so true. And sometimes yeah. it's the best support we can get, right? So. Right, right. So if, if, everyone's, if anyone is interested, please look up TAP 101, T-A-P space 101. You apply there for membership. We accept you. We, you know, it's kind of just like a beginner thing, and then we quickly move you over to tap. Um, and if you're interested in my book, it's just markhaglandbook.com. Yeah, I put that in the chat as well. Oh, great. So. Thank you. Um, thank so, you, Betsy. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you um, very much for volunteering your time this evening. And I, I hope that this is a popular recording. You um, have so many words of wisdom. Um, mm. I, I hope it has a nice long shelf life out there for people to um, to partake, partake from that. Um, Very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, as many of you know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit organization serving individuals family, and families impacted by adoption, kinship, and foster care um, through support, education, and advocacy. Uh, to find out more about us, you can go to our website, um, adoptionnetwork.org. We are a membership organization, so we hope that you'll consider joining us. And we hope to see you in a couple weeks when we have our next Monday evening um, with speakers discussing uh, advocacy to create a child welfare youth ombudsman's office here in Ohio. And uh, continue to take a look at our calendar as we post more offerings beyond that. So thank you for joining us this evening. Good night.